everybody, Charles for HumbleMechanic.com. Today, I'm going to be taking your questions on buying used Torags, not replacing gaskets, AdBlue heater failures, and more. This is episode 130 of the Humble Mechanic Podcast. All right, so to get a question on a show like this, email me, charles, at HumbleMechanic.com, and be sure to put question for Charles in the subject. Also, you guys have been doing an awesome job of asking the question, hitting the enter button a couple of times, then give me the information down below. That way I know exactly what your question is and can fill in the details as we need it. All right, before we get into the show, let's talk about the sponsor of the day, which is CRP Automotive. CRP deals on a ton of OE maintenance and repair parts, timing belt kits, water pumps, bushings, and even fluids. In fact, they make the factory DSG fluid for Volkswagen and Audi. So check them out at crpautomotive.com. All right, let's get in to your questions. First up, hey, I'm buying a secondhand 2007 Torag. Is it good? Is it bad? Any common issues with it? Any advice? What are the most important things in a Torag to check before buying? Is the V8 better than the V6? Is there any way to know the real odometer reading, even roughly? How do I know it hasn't been altered? Thanks so much. So let's talk about the odometer thing first. If it's been altered, you're probably not gonna know. One thing you can do is run a Carfax, and that will give you odometer readings anytime someone's reported something. But understand that not everywhere reports Carfax. And, and Carfax isn't just for like when a car was in an accident. A lot of times states will report when the vehicle was registered. Some places will report when maintenance is done. But you can look at the um, mileage readings over the time and see whether it was like 120,000 and then the next time it was 80,000. That will be like a huge red flag, and I think actually Carfax will even tell you when something like that happens. I will say though, with odometer altering, that is much less of an issue now than it was years and years ago. You can't just roll back the odometer you know, by taking the cluster out. This is all done through a computer, and a lot of times it's more hassle than it's worth for somebody to do that. At any point in time though, the cluster could have been replaced, and the mileage may be not punched in right. That really all depends. So the best defense there is running a Carfax. As far as whether the 2007 Torag is a good buy or not, case by case basis, I really don't know. I like that generation Torag. That is past all of the unhappiness of the 2004 uh, uh, Torag and all the issues that we had with them way back when. So that's a really good thing. Understand though that a 2007 Torag is now a 10 year old vehicle. And while you may only pay $12,000 for it, $10,000 for it, something like that, you're still going to be maintaining a $50,000 SUV. So maintenance costs are still gonna be high on it. As far as things to look for, like I always say every single time, like a broken record, take the car, take the Touareg, and take it somewhere that knows the Volkswagen Touareg and get it inspected. This is one place where I would probably, before I just blindly took it to the dealership, I would call and ask them if they had somebody that was, you know, the quote Torag expert uh, or not. Because remember, we're 10 years old. The new Torags are far separated from what that generation Torag was. So you want to make sure that there's someone that's been around for a while that really understands that Torag. But to be honest, that generation Torag was really good. You know, the V8 has a timing belt, so that's going to be something that needs to be serviced. The V6 didn't. The V6 had very limited, very limited issues with timing chains and oil pump bolts breaking like uh, like the Passats did. So, you know, is one better than the other? I don't know, it's really up to you. I like the VR6 of that vintage, but I also really like the V8 because other than timing belt issues, it was a pretty damn good engine. But you're gonna wanna make sure that all the faults are scanned, everything is checked, you know, top to bottom, left to right. This is gonna cost you 150 bucks or so to get this all inspected, but it's gonna be money well spent on the vehicle. Remember, like I said a minute ago, you're still fixing, you're still maintaining a 40, 50, 60, whatever thousand dollar vehicle. So it's expensive to maintain. I would wanna make sure that the maintenance things were all taken care of before I bought it. But you know, right now buying a used Touareg isn't really a terrible decision. In fact, if I could find one at a good price that was well maintained, I would probably buy one myself. But it's interesting now to see like how outdated, especially the interior, of that Torag really is. You know, the, the center console where the radio and the AC controls are is so outdated compared to uh, compared to what we're looking at now, where it was so advanced for, uh, for the time it went out. So I don't know, it's a cool car. Again, be sure to make sure you get it inspected. It's gonna be the best money you'll ever spend. Either you're gonna know all the problems with it and buy it anyway and know what you need to fix, or you'll maybe avoid a real catastrophe by uh, buying a car that needs you know, $5,000 worth of work. Be sure to have them check the carrier bearing for the prop shaft. 
Make sure that the front rear diffs aren't making any noise. Those were sort of common, you know, depending on mileage. Make sure everything works in the car. Make sure the spare tire's there. And again, you want a full scan of the vehicle to know if there's any fault stored in any of the systems. All right, next up from Jeff. I have a 2007 Jetta 2.5 liter. The alternator failed, so I removed it from the top at my house. In order to remove it, I needed to remove the intake manifold to get the alternator mounting bolts. The question I have is, do I have to replace the O-ring between the cylinder head and intake manifold? I went to the Volkswagen dealership to purchase new ones, and they wanted $27 Canadian for each ring. I told them to keep them, and I will try my luck. Um, Jeff, that's a <laughs> that's a good question. I, you know, we just happened to look up the price of one of those uh, small gaskets that goes between the intake manifold and the cylinder head on a 2.5 earlier last week, and they are ridiculous. They're like 25, 26 bucks a piece U.S. So, you know, what would I do? I would probably reuse them. Look, this is a part that you're taking off yourself, so you know how to take it on and off. This is a part that's actually not that hard to take off anyway. If, let's say, you reuse it and something weird happens, you get a system lean fault or a misfire on that cylinder, um, you know, you can always go back in and replace the gaskets. It's not like you have to take the cylinder head off where you're going to be buying, you know, an $80 gasket and $100 worth of bolts. This is a couple of hours worth of work, and to me, I would try and save the money and not replace them. The one caution I will have is you want to make sure that they're in good condition. If you pull that intake manifold off and the O-ring is all wonky and weird, you probably want to replace it, or at least the one that's weird. If it looks pretty good, like there isn't an issue, go ahead and put the intake manifold back on, keep a really close eye on it, and you'll probably be fine. I know I have reused those gaskets as well before because they are so damn expensive. I will tell you though, if you forget to put the gasket in altogether, um, it'll create a misfire on that one cylinder, which is rather interesting to watch. Uh, one cylinder misfire because you, you, know, you forgot that rubber O-ring. So it's one of those parts that I don't really hesitate too much to reuse. Of course, in a perfect world, you know, the right way is to replace it, but you know, we don't live in a perfect world, so I would roll the dice on it, I would reuse them, and, you know, honestly hope for the best. All right, next one comes from Marcus. Hey Charles, my name is Marcus and I have a problem. Right now I work for a dealership as a lube tech, and I love working on cars and learning new things, but I don't know if I'm in an honest shop. I've been there for over a year, but eight months of it was really as a detailer and about six as a lube tech. My concern is I'm currently in school for automotive classes, and once I've taken maintenance and re light repair, I started to notice a lot of problems around the shop. First of all, I haven't seen an inspector come by since I've been there. I've yet to find an MSDS sheet, the lifts haven't been inspected in years, the used oil tank is leaking, and we've been reportedly told that they were getting a new one, but I haven't seen that happen and don't see it happening anytime soon. I could go on and on about how it is illegal, but I won't waste your time any more than I have. My question is, is if this is normal or do I just work at a bad dealership? I've wanted to work for a VW dealership since I got into cars. I own an 85 Jetta and I love it. I thought about applying to one near me, but my dealership has made my schedule perfect around school and I'm worried that if I move dealerships, they won't adjust for me. I'm also hesitant to leave because I've already become accustomed to my dealership and I don't know how hard it will be to adjust to a new dealership. Marcus, you got a boatload of issues, man. Um, all right, let's, let's break this apart. Let's talk about the issues with the dealership, the MSDS, the leaking oil tank, the lifts not being inspected. Dude, this is serious stuff. Depending on where you're at in the, in the country, you know, if you're a union shop, you have the union to, to sort of go uh, to bat for you. But look, man, I would talk to the service manager and go, look, man, we don't have MSDS sheets, that's a safety concern. The lifts haven't been inspected, that's a safety concern. Our oil tank is leaking, that's a safety concern as well as an environmental concern. And have the conversation with them about their strategy to get it fixed. Now, I will tell you, as a new guy, as a lube tech, that's probably not going to go over very well. So what do we do? Um, tough call. You know, I might be looking at talking to someone in HR about this. I'm, I'm a little hesitant to sort of go around the service manager. But talk to the service manager first and see if you can get anywhere. Because again, this is serious, serious safety things. If an OSHA inspector came in, you guys would get fined big time. You know, it's it's a thousand dollars plus for every one of the violations that uh, that a dealership can get, potentially even more. And when they find that the oil drum is leaking, especially if it's leaking, let's say, into the ground, that's a big time fine. So I would have a talk with the service manager. If you don't get anywhere with him or her, I would talk to the HR department and just be like, look. 
This doesn't feel like a safe environment for me. Which leads me to my next point. Let's say you do this, this very well could cost you your job. I think if it costs you your job, the dealership might have bigger problems on, on their hands because uh, there's some occupational safety issues that are going on and they can't really fire you for bringing those to attention. Um, but you know, you, you had said the dealership's got a great schedule and you're accustomed to it there. Dude, if it's not safe, what the hell are you doing there? If you're having to worry about a lift breaking, you got no business there. I was sure as hell wouldn't work there. And I, you know, that was at my dealership. I love working at my dealership, but if there was a situation where I felt like something was unsafe and nobody was doing anything about it, psh, gone. My toolbox has got wheels. I'm rolling it out the door. No matter how accustomed you feel to this place, and no matter how hard it's gonna be to go somewhere else, your safety is more important than all of that crap. Look, you started there and you didn't know anything, let's say, and you became accustomed to that place, just like you would become accustomed to any other dealership. You know, I get confused as to why us technicians feel like I'm stuck, I can't do anything. Dude, there's probably 50 dealerships within 10, 15 miles of you that would be really happy to have someone going to school, learning how to fix cars, and already knows things like basic maintenance. Don't hesitate to roll your toolbox down the road. If the situation's not right, especially when it comes to safety, lock it up and roll out. Let's as technicians stop feeling like, you know, the, the dealership owns us and we can't do anything about it. That is total crap. And like, it's all I can do to filter out the 700 swear words that I wanna drop because it's total crap. You guys run the show. You guys are the ones that fixes the cars. You are replaceable, so they can get someone else in no problem, but look, they're replaceable too. You can just as easily as you got your first job, lock your box and go somewhere else. And if you tell the next place, look, it was safety concerns that had me not wanting to work there anymore, that's good, because now I know, let's say I was hiring you, now I know I have someone that pays attention to this crap, that gives a damn about where they work, the safety of themselves, and the safety of their coworkers. So if this were me in this situation and management didn't want to do anything about it, I'd roll. I understand that as a new technician, it's a lot harder to do that. But again, let's collectively as technicians realize that we can go work anywhere. If it's a different car line, it may suck for six months. But you know what? It probably sucked for a little while when you started there too because you didn't know anything. So you can learn all of these things. The difference now is you already have an arsenal of knowledge that you can apply to working on this new car line. So, uh, Marcus, I'm not beating up on you, man. I'm, I'm really not. You know, I feel for your situation. It's a tough call, especially as a new guy. But that goes out to all my other technicians that I hear crying about how bad their dealership is and how they can't do anything else. Dudes, ladies, it's crap. You can do something else. You can go somewhere else. You can go on another car line. Quit bitching about it and do something about it to make the situation better. So Marcus, awesome question, man. Again, I feel for you. I hope it works out for you, but uh, when it comes to safety issues, I don't play around with it. All right, before my blood pressure goes through the roof, let's take the next question. This one comes from Dave who has two questions. Of the current 15 and 16 models, which is the most reliable? I currently have two TDIs, a 12 Golf and an 11 Torag. If VW offers favorable trade-ins for other VWs, what other VW model should I look at? Love the mileage and power of the TDI. I won't need it to be a golf. Just wanted to know, in general, what's your opinion on the most reliable powertrain? Um, so Dave's got two questions. Let's field this one first. You know, the 15 and 16, I'm almost hesitant to even say because really right now, I don't know. The longevity of the 1.8 turbo is still very much unknown. It's still very much a new engine for us. It's been around a couple years, but it's still pretty new. Uh, plus, we have this camshaft thing like looming over our heads, so I don't really know what's going to go on with that. Um, the DSG transmission has kind of been fine-tuned now to the point where I think it's pretty good. I like the 2.0-liter in the GTI, depending on you know which kind of route you're going to go. The 1.4, in the U.S. anyway, is rather unknown as well. So we're kind of in this limbo state where, you know, these engines have been out a little bit, but I'm very hesitant to say because here's why. When the BPY came out for the first year or so, I thought it was great, and then I got proven wrong. When the TSI came out, I'm like, finally, they fixed all the BPY issues, and we had other problems. So it, it's really hard to say today, you know, it's uh, like mid-February 2016, what the reliability and longevity of the 2015-2016 model year power plants are going to be. So I'm, I'm going to hold on that question. I'm going to reserve judgment. The 1.8 right now would probably be my choice because I couldn't get a diesel. 
Uh, and that's just because it's been around the longest. The camshaft thing, while we don't know what's gonna go on, doesn't really worry me. It's gonna get taken care of. It's just kind of the time frame of that. If we didn't have that issue, I would say, you know, the 1.8's been pretty good. It did have that recall on the fuel rail. That's got taken care of now. I haven't seen one of those come into the dealership in months. So the 1.8 from today, I would probably say is you're gonna be your best bet overall. All right, Dave's second question. Have you heard of the issues with the heaters in the AdBlue tanks? and why it wouldn't be covered under emissions warranty. So Dave sent me this great article that I will be sure to link for you guys to check out about the AdBlue heaters. This is a small problem in the Torag. This is a much larger issue in the Passats. Part of that is volume just because there are so many more Passats. So what's happening is the heater in the AdBlue tank, which is in the back of the vehicle, is failing. Check engine light comes on, AdBlue heater circuit, fault stored, the repair has become to be a heater inside the AdBlue tank. Um, not an uncommon thing. It's not like we replace everyone either. But the reason I really like this question, Dave, is because you asked something that, one, I don't know the answer to, but I really like to talk about it. And that's why this isn't covered under the federal emissions warranty. On gas cars and diesels as well, federal emissions covers catalytic converters and ECMs, as well as a couple of other things for eight years, 80,000 miles. This is a little different in California. Some of the warranty is broader. Some of the warranty is longer. So, you know, I don't really focus on the California emissions because I'm not in California, but there are different laws in California, usually a bigger amount of warranty, both in time and coverage. So why isn't the part that directly injects fluid into the exhaust to control emissions not covered under the emissions warranty? Dave, that is a great question, and I don't know the answer to it. But I will tell you my thoughts on it for better or worse. I think it's complete crap that it's not covered under the federal emissions warranty. This is an emissions control, right? Dieselgate, emissions scandal, blah, 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 is related directly to this part. If this part is required to control emissions directly, like it controls, it pumps fluid, the, the pump in the, the, the things in the tank, right? It's inside the tank that is the fluid that's pumped into the exhaust. The injector is bolted right into the exhaust. Why wouldn't it be covered? I don't know. I don't know, I don't know. I think it should be 100%. I think it should be at minimum covered under the 880 and then, you know, beyond there. It should be covered. It should be covered. It should be covered in my opinion. But as we all know, my opinion on what should be covered under Volkswagen warranty does not mean diddly crap. So what can we do? if we have an AdBlue tank heater fault and we're out of warranty. We got a couple of options. My first thing would be I would call Volkswagen of America and go, yo, you guys are having diesel problems anyway. I got a bad heater. This is an emissions component, sort of, indirectly. Uh, I think you should pay for it and see what they say. Uh, I would probably be a little nicer, <laughs> nicer about it than that. Two, we have diesel issues anyway. You know, this, this is something that maybe you could use that to your advantage when calling Volkswagen uh, about your diesel ad blue heater issue. The other option is to hold on to and not fix it, which I almost am hesitant to recommend because what happens as that fluid cools, it tends to crystallize. We may end up creating more issues by not getting it fixed. So if Volkswagen doesn't help and we don't wanna let it go too long, we get it fixed. We get it fixed and we hold our receipt. We hold our receipt because at some point, there may be some warranty extension on it. At some point, there may be a campaign on it. At some point, there may be a software update that changes the parameters on it and a warranty extension there. All of this is at some point, maybe. I'm not saying it's gonna happen, but anytime something like that happens, you need to keep the receipt in a place where you can find it. Of course, I think you should be keeping all your records in a place you can find it anyway, but this one in particular, keep the receipt, hold on to it, wait. Maybe Volkswagen will come out with something, maybe they won't, but in my opinion, this should be covered under the emissions warranty. But like I just said, what I think about it matters this much to the people that can actually do something about it. All right, two in a row getting my blood pressure up. Let's take another one. William asks, I currently have a 10 Jetta TDI. Once the diesel gate dust settles, I plan on trading the car, not because of emissions, but my wife and I have a four month old baby and the struggle with the child seat in the Jetta. Uh, I'm likely going to be purchasing a pre-owned Tiguan, especially after watching your parts failed video on the Tiguan. I can deal with every issue except the timing chain tensioner. Would it be unrealistic for me to ask the dealer as part of the deal to assure the latest tensioner revision 
is on the car as a condition of purchase. Does the sale department have any pull over the service guys on used cars to get TSBs and upgrades like this done? Who eats the cost? The dealership as a whole, the sales department, or is it just pushed back to the customer as part of the, as William says, deal? I know someone personally that ate a 2.0 TSI from failure of the tensioner and I don't wanna drive around with the ticking time bomb. William, awesome question. So we're thinking about buying a Tiguan. Uh, good call. Our little one did very well in, in the, the back of the Tiguan. It's a little light on room, but it'll be very similar to your Jetta. It's actually the back end of a Golf more or less, so there is a decent amount of room in the back. But that's not your question. Your question is about getting the timing chain tensioner replaced as part of the deal. Here's my thought on it. It doesn't hurt to ask. It doesn't hurt to say, hey, can you at least check this, right? Uh, you know, half hour worth of labor to the service department, they check it and tell you whether or not you have the new one or the old one. The worst thing they're going to say is, no, we're not going to do that for you. The best thing they're going to say is, yeah, we'll take care of that. The question is, who eats the cost? Well, it all depends. Um, most of the time, the cost of that is built into the price of the car. So in that respect, who pays the cost? It's the person buying the car. Uh, remember, dealerships are not in it to lose money, even though they do at times. Uh, they're also not in it to take advantage of people, despite what uh, what a lot of people have experienced and a lot of people have, have thought over the years. Uh, again, I say it all the time that the auto industry has earned very much its reputation. Uh, I, would, I would definitely ask, uh, try and get it worked out. Maybe you can work out something where you buy the parts, they pay for labor. Of the two choices, whether to pay for parts or labor, I'd want to pay for parts because it is less than labor. Uh, and, and see, you know, how much, how much do they have in the car? How much have they marked up the car? How much are they losing on selling you the car? All those things are really going to depend on whether or not they're going to be able to work that into the deal or not. You know, for me, if I had to pay 500 bucks to get that done at the time I bought the car, I think that would be well worth it. You can also look at a newer Tiguan. I think 14 should be safe from, uh, from the old tensioners and, and go from there. You know, you, You'd mentioned when the diesel gate thing settles, that's probably not going to be any time until the end of 16 at the earliest from, from what we've been told. So you got some time by then. Model year 14 is two years out. We're looking forward to the 17 Tiguan coming out, which would probably bring the price down of the 14 model year Tiguan. So buying a 14 may be well within within the realm of, of what you're looking for. Plus I would probably get this car as a used certified car, which then would cover the uh, cover the timing chain tensioner out a little bit further than, than the base warranty. We can also look at getting an extended warranty that would take care of that. And, and then if it does fail, well, at least you have a warranty extension. But I would absolutely ask, I would push pretty hard about it to see if they would uh, they would get that taken care of for you. And hopefully you got a great dealership that'll be willing to work with you. Are they going to pay for it all 100%? No. Uh, you're going to pay for some of it one way or another, whether it's built into the price of the car, whether it's added onto the car afterwards. You know, it, it really all depends what you work out. But I would absolutely 100% ask. And like I said, the worst they're going to say is no. William actually also had another question about the Americanizing of the Passat specifically. Um, and I actually am going to hold that question because I think I'm going to do a little bit longer show about it. I want to go into that a little bit more than maybe for a Q&A show. But William, that was an awesome question too. So down the road, be on the lookout for a whole show about the Americanizing, as you put it, of the Volkswagen Passat. Oh, and for the record, I don't necessarily disagree with putting it that way. All right, got time for one more. This one comes from Tom. How do you progress from being an amateur mechanic doing brake jobs and similar from YouTube videos to learning how to do more advanced tasks that require much more detail, like rebuilding engines? The reason I ask is I have learned to do everything on cars where it is a swap in and swap out, such as brake pads, plugs, wires, coils, shocks, struts, etc. I did my first engine replacement on my daily driver this summer, but I swapped out a junkyard engine. How do you progress from pulling out bad things and putting new or used things to learning how to do high level work? I would ideally like to rebuild my father's Subaru engine, which has 180K while I do the head gaskets. I think I can do it, but it feels like a mighty leap. Tom, great question. So um, honestly, man, what you're talking about, I feel like you probably could, could handle just fine. You're gonna absolutely 100% want to have a repair manual, the service manual, ideally, when uh, when you're doing the the engine rebuild, because there are a lot of torque specs and you know gasket material placements that you're gonna want to make sure you follow. 
to the letter. So make sure you have the manual. I don't really like the let's call them consumer level manuals that are out there. I would want a factory Subaru manual when, when doing that job. The truth of it is, is we're not talking about rebuilding race car engines. You know, we're not building F1 engines. We're not building IndyCar engines. So your nuts and bolts mechanical skills should be enough to help you rebuild the engine, depending on how deep you're gonna go. Are we going to be doing head work or are we gonna take the head off and send it to the machine shop? Are we gonna be honing the cylinders in the engine or are we gonna send that to the machine shop? Are we gonna be re-ringing or are we gonna send that to the machine shop? It really all depends. But based on the jobs that you said you've already done, I wouldn't hesitate to do this at all. You know, rebuilding an engine like you're talking about is not the hardest thing in the world. Again, repair manual is gonna be your best friend here, but it's still just nuts and bolts for the most part. Now I'm not belittling you guys that rebuild engines professionally because you do a lot more than the average person is going to do rebuilding an engine at their house. I'm not taking anything away from the machine shops that do very precision work. It's totally different. You guys that build race car engines, again, totally different ball game than rebuilding an engine on a car that you're gonna drive daily. So Tom, I think you got the skills for it already based on what you said you've done. Again, repair manual. Now, let's say we're gonna step out of the rebuilding engines and get into something that's not so nuts and bolts, that's diagnostic, that's maybe testing things. You're gonna need to do a couple of things. You're gonna understand that you need test equipment. So you need to learn how to use a multimeter. You need to understand that for every test that you're gonna do, there is equipment that you may need for it. So if you're doing, let's say, a fuel system test, testing fuel pressure, you need a fuel pressure gauge, and on and on and on. There are tons of online resources as well that can help you with that. Scanner Danner has an awesome book about testing sensors and diagnosing cars. I'll try and find a link and put it up. That dude is awesome anyway. You should check out his channel. You should subscribe to him if you guys uh, already don't, which I assume most of you guys do because he's a super smart dude. But um, you know, those are the kind of places I would look if I wanted to go down the diagnostic route. But simply rebuilding an engine, nuts and bolts style, dude, you got the chops. I would go ahead, rock and roll. And uh, remember, torque specs are your friend. Repair manual is your friend. Follow the book, you'll be just fine. All right, guys, I'm gonna wrap it up there. If you have any questions or comments, post it in the comment section below. Hey, if you like the video, throw it a thumbs up on YouTube. I always appreciate that. You can also subscribe on YouTube or on the blog at humblemechanic.com. You can follow me on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, the blog, and obviously right here on YouTube. All right, guys, thanks for watching, and I will see you next time. The, uh, the drink of the day is still tea. It's freezing out here, not really, but it's cold out here. But uh, drink of the day in my ASE coffee mug. One that I never get to use because my wife loves this mug.